Here is a story that you don't usually hear until it's over. At the point it starts, no one can see it. Right at this moment, it's just coming to be. It's not fiction. It's not make-believe. It's a true story, pre-told. You see, some people tell you that's just the way things are. And that's where our story begins. We won't stand for that. We are visionaries. We are reimagining hospitality. And it's not confined by the walls of a hotel. It's a whole new way to live. The way we see it, it's not an evolution. It's a revolution. A leap into the future. So this is the story of tomorrow. Our story. Because the future belongs to those who design it. And we're going to bring you there first. I hope you, you heard the line in the movie who says, the world belongs to those who design it. And I had no idea that it would be the topic of this session. Before I start, let me tell you why I am dressed like this. Yes, it's because I'm in India, of course, but, and it's a big but, I've been coming here many times over the last six years. I am a true passionate of India and your country. And I was yesterday at the Pullman Delhi airport, and there's a wonderful chef, culinary chef. And every time I travel, which is 260 days a year, I meet many chefs working at Accor, and in some occasions I invite those special person for 10 days in Paris as a chef. And they work for 10 days in the Paris headquarters to basically export their expertise, Indian cuisine, to Paris for 10 days and serve all the Accor guests in Paris headquarters. And here am I three months later, and I bump into him yesterday morning for breakfast, and we hug. And 12 hours after, at night, he knocks on my door. And I said, Chef, what are you doing? He said, well, I brought this for you. This was the suit and this. And I was shocked. He was in tears. I said, Chef, you're not a tailor, are you? He said, no, but I've done this for you. But I said, how do you know whether it's going to fit? He said, please try it. So I tried the suit and everything, and it fitted, I think, very well. And I said, how do you know my size? He said, sir, I know your size because I feed you. <laughs> so, and it's, it is really not anecdotal. I am... He was extremely emotional. I was extremely moved. So I promised to him, I said, Chef, I'll make you a huge promise, which is an easy promise. Tomorrow in Mumbai, at my speech on the stage, I will be wearing what you gave me. So, and I'll go back to human touch in 20 minutes. And I have 20 minutes to persuade you that as good as Oyo, we're not dead. <laughs> and we are not Stone Age. And it's, and I told Aditya, because I've known him what he was at Indigo Airline, because Indigo Airline is very close to my heart and very close to our core, the partnership. And I told him, it's actually funny because Airbnb, Oyo, and many others, they just give me that supplement energy to kick their ass. So, so it actually gives me that, which, and I think it's heavily needed. And I'll tell you what happened, because it's the subject of tonight. And I'm trying to simplify everything for you in three distinct phases in the time of hospitality. You basically start with 40 years, easy, 1960, 
2,040 years of unstoppable growth in the hospitality sector in America, in Europe, major markets. Hilton, Marriott, Intercon, Wyndham, Choice, Accor, many people had a great run. For 40 years, we have been just deploying a very simple business model. You invent a product, you put as many norms, standards as you can, don't even think of your clients, do mass marketing, push it, they will accept it, and replicate the same boring room in as many countries as you can, and people feel comfortable because they recognize the lamp, the bed, and the room. And that is called Novotel, Crown Plaza, Hilton, Holiday Inn. And we were part of it. And it worked. It worked beautifully for 40 years. And we felt we were super smart. But then in 2000, you have a second phase. Evident. And it took us at least five years to wake up. That is when you cannot push a product anymore. You have to be client-minded. And those 15 years, 2000, 2015, you basically have the TripAdvisor, the Kayak, the Booking.com, the Expedia, the C-Trip of the world, basically giving so much information to the clients that finally the clients wanted something different. They wanted something more unique. They wanted to have less norms. So they basically wanted to be fed on what they wanted as opposed to us feeding them on what we felt they wanted major disruptions, and it has a major impact on the hospitality sector. And even some unknown brands with only 20 existing sites get to be visible because they are on social networks, because they are more unique, because they are more fun, because they are more modern, sexy, trendy, you name it. They exist. And now you are in phase number three for the last probably 18 months, and that phase number three is OYO, Tribo. What have they done? They've done something very simple. They added two bucket of players. They added hospitality chain with online platform, online travel agencies, and they combined those two guys, which never been combined together, really. And they decided to go to the fragmented market, they are absolutely correct, that we missed. And we missed it for one reason. We cannot, with the vertical organization, the cost heaviness of the big guys, you cannot deploy our system to less than 30 rooms hotel. Because they won't pay you enough for us to deploy basically the mass. But they're doing it because they started with a blank sheet of paper, a new savvy technology, more agility, less cost burden, horizontal information, and no privilege, no social status, no hierarchy as we have. The problem is, is first phase, 40 years. Second phase, 15 years. I can tell you that phase number three, probably going to be less than five years because everything accelerates. And in five years, you will have probably artificial intelligence, machine learning stepping into our system with what I'm going to talk to you now, which is the big players which we haven't seen yet into our industry. The Google, the Facebook, the Amazon, the Microsoft, the Tencent, the Alibaba, the JDCom of the world. So it's fairly easy to see what's been moving. But what have we done at that core? Because making a diagnostic, you're good enough. How do you adapt to what's happening in the world? I'll, I'm a lucky guy. I came from the finance industry, private equity. I did not know really the hospitality sector, even though Colony Capital was a big investor in hotels, and I stayed there 15 years. I had fresh eyes and kind of a fresh blood, and I have to tell you, I've never managed more than 30 people in my life. And I went from 30 people that I managed six years ago to today 300,000 people. That's a big gap. 
and you have to be pretty audacious or blind to elect me five years ago. So I said when I came in six years ago, I said, well, we'd better wake up. There are three or four things we have done wrong. One, we keep owning real estate. 2,000 hotels, half of the network. You can't, in today's world, invest in plumbing, electricity, maintenance, renovation. At the same time, you have to invest in technology, customer relation, loyalty, brand, and other things. You have to make a choice. Even more so when you're a listed company, the more real estate you have, the greater volatility you have in your results. As a patrimoine, as a family ownership, please own hotels. I've been in real estate for five generations, my family. I'm real estate passionate. It makes a lot of sense to own hotels, but not for publicly held, in, for publicly held company. So I said, we need to go asset light. We need to basically sell the real estate, get the proceeds, and reinvest the proceeds in better brand, better segment, better geography, and invest quite a bit in IT system and that customer relationship. So we sold seven and a half billion of real estate that we had in Europe. We collected back 4.8 billion, and we still have 35%. So now our core is 95% asset light. When I started, it was 50%. And we're going to go all the way to 100%. Second thing, don't remain into the economy mid-scale segment because it is extremely commoditized product, extremely price sensitive, less experience because you have less manpower to service people. And this is the market that Booking, Citrip, Expedia tackled the first because they provided seamless journey and in you know, some occasions, better pricing. You have to go up into the segmentation to upper upscale to luxury, because when you are a luxury client, you don't go through the OTA. You're very loyal to Oberoi, you're very loyal to Mandarin, you're very loyal to Four Seasons, and you're very loyal to <coughs> Fairmont and Raffles. So we acquired four billion of luxury brands over the last two and a half years, and today, it is half of the group is luxury, and we are the second largest luxury operator after Marriott in the world. When I started, that was 10% of our core. Third, change the way you think. Forget only thinking of your product and your norms and your standardization. Move away from it. Make your mid-scale hotel in Delhi different from the one in San Paolo, different from the one in Paris, different from the one in Melbourne. It has to be localized. It has to be unique experience. People have to know when they wake up, if they woke up in San Paulo or if they wake up in Melbourne. Different experience. And then you have to basically change the entire organization by killing privileges, by going from vertical to horizontal. Everybody who's been there for 35 years who wants to secure his status, shoot the guy. Because the guy who is 25 years old will not wait 20 years to be able to speak. He will move away. And those two populations don't really listen to each other. And the guy at 55 years old don't want to let go because he himself waited 20 years to be able to speak. But no, the new generation may not be smarter, but they have an agility, a predictability of the future which is 10 times greater than mine, which is why it's of no accident. 90% of the new economy players in the world, whether they are in Israel, whether they are in India, whether they are in France or in America, have been created by people less than 35 years old. 90% of them. And 90% of them start with a blank sheet of paper. No legacy, no vertical organization, no privileges, no history. So basically, they have agility. So transformation of Accor, and Accor went from 9 billion business volume, 20 billion business volume, 160,000 people, 300,000 people, and a super big, never being stronger company as we are today. But that's not good enough, because I'm strong, but everybody else is strong. So it is indispensable, but it doesn't make a huge difference. 
So now you pause and you're asking yourself, who is now playing in the travel tourism space? That's again very easy to assess. You have three buckets of players of distinct size. First bucket of players, all the new economy guys, digital driven, who did not exist 20 years ago. Airbnb, Oyo, Booking, Expedia, Citrip, Agoda, you name it. Probably 50 of them. They are super good. They're either taking commissions away from me or they're taking clients away from me. And they grow, and they've been growing for the last 20 years, 50% per annum. Probably unstoppable. They have a lot of financing behind them. They're smart, and they find the loophole that we missed. Bucket number two. I keep saying eight gorillas. Five American, Myriad, Hilton, Intercon, Hyatt, Wyndham. They control those five, 70% of the US market. They're big, they're smart, they know their customers, and they deploy internationally. Two Chinese, Jingzhong, state-owned Shanghai, now number two in the world, China Lodging, privately held Shanghai. Those two guys are also growing at 50% per annum, and they quickly building up probably a controlling share in the supply market in China. The only one of the eight gorillas, non-American, non-Chinese, Accor. And Accor is number one, every place in the planet but China and America. South America, Europe, Southeast Asia, Korea, Australia, Africa, Middle East, Accor is number one. But I will never be number one in America, and I will never be number one in China, because place is taken by people bigger than me. But I can tell you they will never be number one in Europe. Close, the door is closed. But you have a third bucket, which is mostly a lot of the guys you see here, which are the medium-sized mom-and-pop hotel owners, operators. You have tens of thousands of them. Each of them have their own credibility, their own space, their own brand. But five 10% of bucket number three dies every year, disappears. Why? Because they don't have the brand awareness. They don't have the balance sheet. They don't have the technology. They don't have the talent. They don't have the time. Because they need to cope with bucket number one. And they pay more and more commission to those OTAs it started at 10%, then 12%, then 15%, then 22%, and the OTAs control 60%, 70% of their distribution. And bucket number three, before they die, what do they do? They knock on the door of bucket number two because they want to seek protection, because they want us to help them on the distribution side. So we are core acquired partnered with 6 billion euros over the last only three years with companies I did not even know they existed. Did I know about Rixos in Turkey? No, even though they were the largest and still are operated in Turkey. Did I know about Mentis in South Africa? No, it's one of the largest operators in South Africa. Did I know about Aton, Chile, Peru, Colombia? No. Did I know about Mantra papers in Australia? No, they happen to be number two. They called Accor, and we made a deal, 30%, 10%, 80%, does not matter, because they wanted their friendly arms. And for me, it was one added benefit of offering to my clients something they want, which is more unique, more localized, and something which is different from norms and standards. So I'm helping them, and they're helping me. And bucket number two, we're growing at 8 to 15% per annum. So one-fourth of bucket number one. Why are we still alive? Because bucket number three is suffocating. That's simple. Good news, that's going to last another 10 to 15 years. Bucket number three is going to keep knocking on the door of bucket number two, which is why you see so many new franchises 
Franchise means somebody needs a big brand, which is why China, Lodging and Jingjiang go so rapidly because they convert bucket number three into bucket number two, which is why Marriott, Hilton, Intercon go so quickly because they convert bucket number three into bucket number two. It is that simple, except two things. You have a bucket zero, which I've forgotten when I first talked about this. Bucket zero is Google, Marriott, Facebook, Tencent, Alibaba, Jedicom. They are invading our space. Why? Because our space is great. Travel tourism in the world is the most predictable, profitable industry you can think of. It's been growing at 5% per annum the last 25 years, and I bet you it will grow at 5% per annum the next 25 years. Because it is a 20% margin game. And because it is scalable. There's not that many industries which represent 10% of the job on the planet works for travel and tourism, 10%. People are saying for the next five years, 25% of job creation will be in travel tourism. Enormous. So you don't see, and it's a $7 trillion industry. And you have a billion four travelers internationally last year. And that billion four will go to two billion. You know how many travelers in 1960? 20 million. 1980, 200 million. Today, a billion four. Increases by almost 100 million every single year. I am a fortunate guy because it's odd. Since 1950, every year, half of international travelers go to Europe. They go to Rome, they go to Amsterdam, they go to Paris, they go to London. Half. So last year was 700 million. And who is the biggest country in terms of travelers today? China, 140 million. It's being America for the last 15 years. China, for the first time, is now bigger than America. So Google decided two and a half years ago, oh, they should be going into hotel site recommendation. In 18 months, they now have greater numbers of recommendations than TripAdvisor. Google will likely go into the transactional side of the business and probably will damage some way or short, maybe, Booking and Expedia. Google with Google Home and Amazon with Amazon Alexa, those little devices that you have at your home, they're not gimmicky. They are super important for Google and Amazon. Why? Because you feel that you ask that device, what is the weather like? How much time is going to take me to go to work? Well, that's one thing. And could you, pit, could you put Celine Dion, please, music on? Well, that device will do. Except it records everything you say within your home. And we are as idiots that we put it in a kitchen or in the living room, where they can really record absolutely everything. Don't put it in your bedroom, by the way. <laughs> uh, so. That device knows everything about you, your kids, your wife. And I guarantee you, it's only a matter of time, whether it's six months or four years, I don't know. That device will talk to you without you asking it anything. And it will tell you, in six months, in four years, Gaurav, I know you have problem with your bankers. Don't you worry. You being really abrasive with your kids, they hate you. Your wife cannot stand you anymore. But you should go to Jaipur. There is an Ibis hotel. It's on sale for the weekend. Use Indigo Airline. You can get very cheap tickets. I booked everything for you. It's going to cost you only $20 a night, and it's three days package. And that stupid idiot device will say it in front of Gohar's wife and kids. <laughs> so he has no choice. He has to go. But it is Amazon Alexa or Google Home all of a sudden interfering, giving you the date, the price, the brand. So then you have to decide who do you align with. Do you align with bucket number one or do you align with bucket number zero? And Oyo and Tribo and other guys are combining bucket number one and bucket number two already. So that's where we are, because I want to leave time for Q&A. To finish, there is a very good 
French writer, novelist called Saint-Exupéry. Some of you may have read The Petit Prince. And Saint-Exupéry said in 1940 something extremely interesting. And somebody asked him about the future. And he answered, don't even try to predict the future. Just make sure you participate in it. This is what I'm doing. Thank you. So I've been asked to answer two or three questions. I don't know whether anybody has. Uh, hi, Sebastian. This is Arjun Sharma from Select Group. Uh, thank you very much for giving an industry perspective or putting the whole industry into three buckets. But I have a question from you which is slightly different. Uh, what are the three global trends that you see in our industry, in the hospitality and the tourism industry, uh, from your point of view, from Accor's point of view, and, and the really horizontal growth that you demonstrated in your businesses? Um, I see it clearly. I don't know whether I can respond to it easily, and that's a mismatch. First, stop thinking numbers of clients and don't treat a client like a number. A client today is a person, and between what you want at the Pullman and what the guy next door wants to want the same night at the Pullman is vastly different. You have expectations, you want to have an experience, you want to be recognized, you want to be identified, you want to be thanked, and you want to work and play and live at the same time. And for me, I have to adjust, and my, what you may want on Tuesday night, if you're in business, is vastly different from what you may want on Friday night if you're there for leisure, but you're the same person. So customer data is absolutely critical so that I guess we learn who you are and we never ask you the same, the same questions, whether you are in Mumbai, Bangalore, or in Delhi. And that's something which we have to be equipped, which is why bucket number three cannot do this. They don't have the storing capacity and the technology. And we'd better be good at it, because bucket number zero is super good at it. Second trend, which is going fast, which is interesting, is wellness slash detox. Uh, numbers of you in India, in America, we spend on average between two and four hours looking at our cell phone. Totally dependent on the cell phone. And you see for the last 15 months increasing needs from people to have one week, 10 days of total detox. Would you please help me to move away from my technology? And we need to adapt the hotel for those people they don't need to go fasting, but they want to finally breathe, have some oxygen, stop reading and stop to be on the immediate kind of actually dependency. Um, and the third is, since there is a billion or four travelers today coming from all over the planet, and you have new Korean and Japanese and Chinese and Indian and Chilean, I have to be able to respond and breakfast is a good example. I can guarantee you the Chinese for breakfast want something vastly different from the Malaysian, from the French guy, from the Polish, and have the same breakfast room. And on top of it, some of the food some country wants has a huge smell which doesn't match with other food. So the adaptation in the hotel industry is humongous. So the guess they no longer number their person but you have to basically provide a lot of spaces for different population. And I will give you a fourth one, which is, for me, the most intriguing one. We have been stupid enough to only target travelers to hotel. The part of a hotel is big. We have a lot of square meters, and we have 90% of square meters unused between 9.30 in the morning and 7 p.m. at night. But it's being paid for, it's being invested. We have to open the hotel to the local population, to the local neighborhood. We have Wi-Fi, we have electricity, we have gym, we have a bar, we have a restaurant. We can be co-working spaces. They have to feel that the hotel is not an outsider, but an insider. The minute you increase the doors, the windows of your hotel, the minute somebody is not afraid of me asking him what's your room number, you succeeded by mutualizing an existing square meters to multi-benefits. That's a very interesting trend. Hi. Yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, hi. Hi, Sebastian. Hi. My name is Premal Zaveri. I work for a company called Chalet Hotels. It's an Indian public hey, congratulations. company. Congratulations. You've done a good IPO. Thank you. Um, well, in the process of the IPO, we've also gone through the process of renegotiating some of our hotel management agreements, as well as uh, signing a few, on the verge of signing a few new ones. Now, with, with your entire brand architecture, from Raffles to Ibis, you have a lot of brands yeah. that you all control and manage. 38 today. 38 to be precise. Largest, in fact. Yeah, when I started, it was 12. How, how do you simplify this brand architecture for your customer to make it easy for them to choose something in that moment yeah. of time? I, I'll respond to you in two ways, and the first one reversely. And I've not done enough a good job on telling everybody, including you and my investors, let's not kid ourselves. Out of the 38 brands of our core, 12 of them only are scalable, global, where you should put your priorities in terms of development. Those are Novotel, Pullman, Fairmont, Mantra, Aton, and others. Don't spend too much money on it because they are super efficient locally, regionally, but you can't afford to develop 38 brands on the planet. You can't and you should not. You have to be very draconian, very rigorous on basically choosing which brands should be going global. Only 12. However, I don't agree with you. Customers love it. Within an ecosystem of our core, now which chance there's going to be a new loyalty program called All, our core Live Limitless, which is going to be the new booking engine. Our core Live Limitless, on two clicks, give you access to 38 different brands in 100 countries, and I can guarantee you, Mama Shelter is very different from 25 Hours, very different from Banyan Tree, very different from So. We have 12 lifestyle brands I had nothing 12 years ago. Customers, because of social network, they know very well what is the promise of each brand. They know very well where they want to go. So don't kill the brand, but be careful not to expand it because it's too costly. And I know I said that many times and my investors want to shoot me. I know our core will end up probably with 50 brands. Because every time, because bucket number three is going to be knocking on bucket number two, and I'm going to help them survive in some way, shape, or form, because my clients love those brands and they don't want them to disappear. So that's what we're looking at. Yes, sir. So Uh, on ne voit bien avec le cœur. L'essentiel est invisible pour les yeux. So my mother did her PhD in Anton saint exupéry Oh. And we spent a few weeks last summer at Dagay where the family Thank lives. Thank you. It's a great hospital. Uh, so we're property developers and we have three hotels in Goa. So I was very intrigued when you said it makes a lot of sense to own hotels, to build and own hotels. Yes. If you look at the unencumbered free cash flow, if you look at the return on your net asset, uh, please tell me why it still makes sense for uh, if you have 50, 100, 150, 200 crores to invest in a hotel. Well, I'll tell you because I have three hotels on my own that I own, which is not part of our core because people are going to rewrite the story by seeing conflict of interest and I'm putting all distribution, so I decided that they're not connected with our core. So I have three which I built and I own. The main reason why, there's two reasons why you should have a hotel. One is true for office and also other assets allocation. There's no better deleveraging game than the real estate. 90% of the fortune in the world have been made mostly in real estate because you borrow 60% again to real estate assets and every year you reimburse the debt with the cash flowing of these assets. So, and it's a very secure debt and you have attract, attractive financing and you delever. So over 10 years, your debt is gone and you're happy to own the asset. So it's a deleveraging game. The second reason is this is the only industry where you can reprice your room every night. So it's very inflation proof because you're not under a three, five year, 10 year lease in which you're stuck. But it is a dangerous game because if it turns against you, you can lose a lot of money. This is not a game for amateur but you have good assets into good capital cities, you reprice every night, you take advantage of cycle, and you make great money. So it's a, if you have an EBS hotel for our core, 
on average, investors make 14% per annum on levered. 14% return with no leverage. With leverage, it's probably a 25% return. Net asset value. Oh, yeah. Hey, on net asset value. Ibis, talk to Monsieur Gaurav Busham, he's here. We only have 20. You know, I, I've been saying it. I love this country, but I still need to find the recipe. Please help me. We have 1,800 hotels in France. We have 500 hotels in Germany. We have 400 hotels in England. We have 51 hotels in India. And India is that big and I'm that small. Why is it that we, as our core, we participate in 100 countries, we just cannot scale and only have 25 opening the next three years? We should have in your country probably 200, 300 hotels and we can't get there. I know why a lot is cost of construction, land scarcity, time it takes. But just thinking that 2% of tourism destination only goes to India, it's insane. Between the older civilization, heritage site, geography, architecture, size, and welcoming people, you should be one of the top 10 countries destination on the planet. So whatever I can do to help, I just want to do it. Uh, Hi, Sebastian. Uh, amazing, amazing. Uh, I've heard so much about you, never got to hear your fantastic uh, speech. Thank you. Uh, my name is Kapil Chopra. I run the Postcard Hotel. Previously to this, I was with Oberoi Hotels. Um, and Sebastian, every time we had a review, uh, there's a very strange thing that come, came with your bucket too, which was that the American brands, although they focused a lot on the website and online conversions, I always heard it, I'm not sure if it's true, you can confirm it, that Accor website production beats any brand in the world in terms of either in the luxury or in the mid-scale space. Yeah. What you produce from your website. Uh, and also I heard when I did reviews in Dubai that uh, you have it, uh, that you're so confident about your online conversion numbers that it goes into uh, kind of a contract that the brand website will do so much so. Is this true? What do you do that makes you really way ahead of the American brands in terms of website conversions? Well, it's, it's a very difficult answer. It's a very legitimate question. I'll tell you why it's difficult. I have one disadvantage, which I accept because it is her heritage of 50 years of our core history. Marriott is a commercial brand. Intercon is a commercial brand. Hilton is a commercial brand. Oyo is become a commercial brand. Accor is not a brand hotel brand. It's a corporate name. The only guy compared to me was SPG. SPG is gone, Starwood, and becomes a Marriott. So, and I've been thinking six years ago, should I kill Accor and rename quickly the portal as one of my brands? And the obvious choice at the time would have been Ibis, because Ibis was 50% of Accor. But thank God I did not do it, because had it been Ibis, I would never been able to buy Fairmont, Raffold, and others. So, that's the first thing that I need to tackle, which is difficult. So now I said, Aco is only employer's brand, and employees like because they work for Aco, and it's good for owners because they reassured with the size of Aco as a company and balance sheet. But your question is more precise on technology and mobile app. And I'll say that, I'll say it in public, and it's, I have to be careful because it's, a, it's an assessment of fragility. But I'm very candid and, and lucid. Bucket number one on technology when they spend four billion a year. Booking spends four billion a year in technology. I may spend 400 million a year. So it's time 10. When it takes two minutes for you to book on booking the Novotel in Mumbai, he will take you three minutes on Accor. That one minute, you don't give a damn. You'll go on booking because it's one minute less. I'll be at two minutes for sure in maybe six months but they will be at one minute and 30 seconds. And uh, we should not be tech company. This is not who we are. We are a human personal service company. So I need to find in the next few months uh, the right partnership alignment where you as a client, since everything I do now is client-minded, what is it that I should serve you where you spend as little time on the portal to get you in another hotel the date you want? The problem with that assessment, I'd better find the right horse, because that's a one-way street. There is no way back. So, and just to finish on two seconds, the one thing which I'm so happy about is bucket zero, bucket number one, have something 
that they wish they will get but they will never get. They've never met you. Never ever. But they know you. They know you through technology because you check boxes all the time. Bucket number two, bucket number three, we spend time with you between seven hours and 48 hours. So we have warm data, they have cold data. We have human emotional interaction, they have no interaction. The first guy who's going to be adding the warm and the cold data is a likely winner. So they might need me as much as I need them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Bazzi.